the G600 and G500 are a major leap forward for Gulfstream in terms of the flight deck design, while also launching a new family of long-range jets that take advantage of the latest technology. From the active side-stick fly-by-wire flight controls to the touchscreen-controlled avionics, Gulfstream has leapfrogged its competitors in the technology race and at the same time produced a large modern business jet that is easy and actually fun to fly. One of the neat new features in the G600 and G500 is the touchscreen overhead panel. Where there used to be what seemed like acres of switches and buttons, there are now three touchscreens that are used to control all the aircraft systems. A huge benefit of these new touchscreens is that the pilots can go from dark cockpit to ready for engine start in less than half the time of earlier golf screens like the G550. When we look back at what the directives were for us as the design of the G500, G600, there were three primary things that we were told by our leadership that we wanted to accomplish. One was we wanted to design an airplane and flight deck, five pilots, four pilots to meet our need and do the mission that's required every day on our customers. We wanted to create an airplane that had more capability and functionality, but at the same time make it more intuitive. That one drove a tremendous amount of change in just the way we wanted to interface with the airplane. The third thing was we wanted an airplane that we could power up and taxi away in 10 minutes or less that gave us the ability to focus on other things in preparation for the flight. One of the things you have to remember is this airplane is our office, our living room, our dining room for up to 13 hours on the G600. So when you look, it means any bit of space that we can give back in our operation adds value to our customers. So we have looked to do side sticks now for about a decade. Uh, because there's value. It gives us more space uh, for that area that we, we spend so much time in. It allows us to have a desk on the airplane to work uh, as we're en route and doing our job. Uh, it allows us to reduce weight by reducing the number of components on the airplane. Um, it, it allows us to just have a better environment day in and day out. Uh, it allows maintainability to be easier because the components are fewer on the airplane. But the one thing that we could never overcome as Gulfstream, and we are very pilot-centric, is making sure that the pilots remain in the loop what's happening between each other. Because if you think about it, a column and yoke is an ability to have an unspoken language between the two pilots. If I'm flying and doing a poor job or just struggling with something that's going on, uh, the other pilot can see that without having verbal communication. So we were not gonna be comfortable with going to side sticks, no matter how much value they added, until we could retain that situational awareness between both pilots. So in the design of the airplane, we've been working for 10 years to make it where both side sticks are interconnected to one another. So if I move the side stick on one side, the other stick is following along. And they're not mechanically linked, they're electronically linked. So as I moved one, I'm applying a force. That force makes one, the stick on my side displace, and then the force value gets sent to the other stick, which then displaces by the same amount uh, almost instantaneously. So it maintains that connection. So that's one piece of uh, our ability uh, to change the way we interface with the airplane. How do we add more capability and functionality while at the same time making it more intuitive? As we all know, uh, on a professional flight deck, we've had MCDUs, uh, multifunction uh, control displays, uh, for a long time. Uh, but they require pure rote learning. We have, we're constrained to 12 line select keys, a small screen, and a keyboard, and we have to memorize how to get to everything that we need. Well, w that's not how we can add more capability, because if we add more capability, what happens is we drive the depth of a menu, which requires more selections and more rote learning for us to be able to accomplish that. So we needed a technology shift. And you have to remember when we started this, we, were, we started in a time frame where uh, our personal devices were just coming into being. 
we were instantly attracted to the convertibility and configurability of those displays. We can make an electronic display anything we want it to be. And so we went down the path of trying to determine did those belong on a flight deck. And we spent a tremendous amount of time looking at how to do that. We mounted them in different devices from uh, uh, the back of a van in the very beginning just to test basic turbulence uh, and different technologies. And what we found immediately was absolutely, touch screens belong on a flight deck. So uh, the key though is one, the technology you choose, and two, hand stabilization. We've known for a long time through our CCD that if we stabilize the hand, we can be very accurate with our thumb. So if you look at all our touch screens, they have grips around them. I can stabilize my hand, which then allows me to make a selection and be very accurate with that selection. So uh, the other piece to the decision to go to touch screens was the technology. We looked at everything that was out there at the time when we started. Ultimately, we selected resistive technology because resistive technology allows that we can set how much force is required. So if I want to select something, if this was a capacitive device and I did this, it would try to select it. Here, if I place pressure in a location at the right amount, I get a selection that blooms. But notice just because I applied the pressure doesn't mean that it actuates. It still gives me an opportunity to recover. So if I didn't mean to select menu, I just slide up and nothing happens. I have to land on, lift off, uh, and apply the right amount of pressure for that to become a valid activation. That, in combination with the hand stabilization, has made uh, touchscreens invaluable on the flight deck. It lets us put things the way they need to be for the way that we think as pilots. We have a traditional menu that's federated like we're used to in the selection of FMS or data link or comms or flight guidance. But honestly, that's not how we think as pilots. We think in phases. So if I swipe left to right, I've got my phase of flight menu structure. And then across the top are the different phases. So if I select my startup phase, it gives me the functions that I need for that particular operation. And then the information that I need to monitor as part of my startup activity. Then when I get ready to actually start the airplane, I can configure the forward displays with just selecting DU preset, and now it puts the displays to the way that I need them for the start phase of operation. Uh, then as I move through taxi, again, it gives me the information I need there, and I can monitor what the configuration of the airplane is, turn on my transponder, set the auto brakes for the day, and then DU presets and all the things that are required. Same for takeoff and selection of B-speeds. It tells me if I'm not configured properly by turning the B-speeds amber. And then when I've configured the airplane, then they, they turn and tell me that they're, we're set and configured in the right way. Uh, so every phase is now supporting me through the action of preparing that airplane, which also is feeding back into that initial requirement of 10 minutes or less of being able to taxi from a cold airplane as it leads me through the process. Uh, other things, these, to, as you noticed earlier, I swiped. We needed a way for interrupt tasks. If you think about it, we get interruptions in what we're doing on our radio page and our flight plan. They're immediate actions. And traditionally, on an airplane that had three MCDUs, you would uh, sit there and leave one on radio page. Well, we didn't want to constrain us to that. So we thought, how can we have easy access to radios? So we thought, well, what if I swipe top to bottom? It invokes my ATC page, which gives me quick access to information. I can type the frequency as I'm hearing it. I place it where I want to go, and then it changes the radio to that page. If I'm now coasting out and I'm gonna be oceanic and I need my HF radios, if I have to swipe, I want access to the HF so I can change the island to be what I need for that function so now that's controlling my HF radio. When I get back and coast in, I can go back to a VHF comm and then now I'm controlling that as well. 
If I need to go do bigger tasks like CPDLC, I've got quick access to uh, my CPDLC log, but even better yet, my CPDLC messages pop up like a text message and I can just interact with them on the display instead of going to a specific location to uh, control that action when I get a message. Uh, I can go to my larger comms menu where it has the rest of the menu structure of the things I need. So again, adding that immediate ability and access to, to my communication side of the house. The other interrupt task we always get is associated with flight plans. If I swipe right to left, well then that gives me my flight plan page immediately and now I can interact with that. When I have a full flight plan, I can just drag the fix page and instead of having to page over. Uh, like we do in an MCDU. And then when I want to interact with a fix, I just select it and it tells me everything that I can do to it. All I do is then select and it'll allow me to build, for instance, in this case, a hold and I can view it as, I, as I'm entering it and make sure it's what I want before I apply it to the flight plan and then ultimately accept it. So the touch screens give us that ability for easy information in the MCDU world. We also have the ability for display control. So if we need to, on the phase of flight information, for instance, we give you a, a dual path for control of displays. If I want to control a display, I can select it here, and then it gives me all the different displays to select from. If I wanted DU1, I could select that. And for instance, if I wanted to go, what you're seeing here is an exocentric view sitting on the ramp at Savannah where you can see our hangars and you're actually physically seeing on the display as if it's looking up and behind the airplane so that we have a larger peripheral view. But if I wanted to go out of exocentric view into a pilot's view or an egocentric view of the airplane, then you can do that. And now I've got all the information uh, that I need for a typical flight and, and actually flying the airplane. Uh, it will change to this view with your selection uh, on your phase of flight, but also, worst case, if you pushed up the power levers, it's automatically going to go to that display as well. So the airplane is helping and supporting you uh, as you're moving through the, the things that you're doing. So touch screens give us that capability, but then we gave you multiple touch screens that do the same things. You know, traditionally, we've been constrained to flight plans and communications on the, the center pedestal. In this airplane, you're not. We give you four touch screens on the flight deck and any one of them can do anything. So for instance, if I wanted to change the flight plan on the outboard side, the same swipe will take me to the flight plan and then I can do what I want to do. And then if I wanted to return to where I was, I could. So we, again, are applying the path of least resistance, allowing you as the pilot to get to the information you need and respond to that as quickly as possible. When we look at the number of touchscreens on the flight deck, we have 10. So we've got the four here that are the touchscreen controllers that are our primary interface with the flight deck. There's an identical fifth one that is mounted at the jump seat location that allows for the interface for not only just the jump seat, but the maintenance actions that we have to do every day in our systems page so that they can do the pre-flight of the airplane and prepare it. And also that gives us the ability of redundancy in the event that one of these should fail, we can change the one out of the jump seat location uh, into uh, the flight deck. And in fact, we can take any uh, of the five that we have on board, two of them can be failed and we can still dispatch the airplane. If we look at next as our touch screens would be our uh, SFDs or standby flight displays, their touch as well that allow me the interface to do that and control uh, the display. Uh, and it, if we, from a dispatch perspective, one of those could be failed. In the overhead panel, we have three displays all controlling primary systems. Each one is identical, so if I select fuel on all of them and I select off on the pump, well then that selects and shows on all pages. And so it 
It gives us the information that we need on anyone and gives us three means of control. And then in the overhead, one of those could be failed. So that comes to a total of 10 touchscreens on our flight deck. So our philosophy on the flight guidance panel was really to make it simplistic and divide it into the ways that we operate. Similar to our phase of flight, we want to put control in the area that we're really intending to control. So for instance, we really treat it uh, into five basic zones. You have a speed zone and the controls associated with those. For instance, LNAV is a lateral mode, so LNAV he and heading track are located here in the lateral mode. You've got your vertical mode control here, which allows you your VNAV, vertical speed, and flight path angle selections. And then Felch is really a combination of a vertical mode and an altitude mode. Uh, and then you've got your altitude hold that is here. Our fifth area is really the control mode where we can engage the autopilot and, and auto throttles and which side it's sourcing off of and then commanding it to fly the approach mode. So we really tried to make it simplistic. Uh, we also tried to make it where it's easy to see what we're doing. Uh, for instance, it's obviously a backlit panel, but also we move the indication of selection off of the button to above it. So if you select something, then you can see the change of state without having to remove your finger. So it was, uh, it was a big change in the way that we laid out and interfaced with our flight guidance panel. So when you think about the, the third item that we were really doing was designing an airplane that you could walk up to uh, from a cold airplane and taxiway in a 10 minutes or less, we need to change the philosophy of how we interacted with the flight deck and lay it out for that tasking. So what you'll notice is I'm gonna talk you through how we power up the airplane and basically what the checklist is to bring the airplane alive. So when we first come to a cold airplane, what we're going to do is we're going to come right here. We're going to turn our emergency batteries to arm. We're going to make sure that we get the, the right things that come on board the airplane uh, with that power, which include our touchscreen controllers here in positions two and three and our standby instruments. Once we see that, we're going to come over here and we're going to turn main batteries on. When the main batteries come on, we're gonna get our other two touch screens, we're gonna get our two outboard displays, and we're gonna get two of our overhead panels. We're next gonna flow over and turn on our EBHA and UPS batteries, and at that point, it's gonna power up our overhead panel touch screens number one and number two. When that happens, it's gonna power up on our batteries page and our APU IRS page. So now it sets us up to run, and if the APU wasn't already running, there would be a fire test button right here. I would select that. When I do, it runs the entire fire test of the airplane for both APU and engines. And then at that point, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do APU master on. When I do that, that's going to do a couple of things for us. So the airplane's gonna assume at that point when I select the APU master on, well, you need the nav light and you need the left main uh, boost pump for fuel. So it's gonna bring those on for me. And then I'm gonna reach over and hit the start button. When I hit start, the APU is gonna come online. The APU generator stays in all the time as far as the switch. And as soon as the APU comes online, the generator comes online, and then it turns on the IRSs for me because it assumes we're going flying today. So that's one less thing uh, I've got to accomplish. And it allows me to move here where the cabin galley and 60 hertz are already uh, selected on and ready to go. Then I'm gonna come over to a test page and I'm gonna run a master test. When I do that, that's gonna run the enunciator, smoke, oxygen, and over temp test for me all at the same time. And when I complete that test, I'm basically done in the overhead. Gonna drop down to the center pedestal and on the FMSs, I'm going to come to the flight plan initialization page where I can check my databases of the day and make sure that they're current and that it's found its position. And then I can pull in the source, more than likely by data link. So I'll put in the number, it'll pull in the flight plan and the winds. Once that's complete, 
I can come over to my test page and I'm going to run a, uh, a test of the flight control system. When I do that, that's checking the communication between the side sticks and the fly-by-wire system. It's also the one thing that we still need to check in our trims, is, uh, in our surfaces, is running the trim end-to-end -end for our stab, just to make sure there's no binding. So what happens when I run the FCS test, that does it for me, and because I will have already done my takeoff and landing data inside the FMS, it will know what my takeoff trim of the day is, and it will park the stab at the takeoff trim of the day for me. At this point, I'm complete. I'm ready to start engines. To start engines is as simple as selecting the run switch. When I select run, it tells the airplane that I'm going to select the right engine. The airplane says, well, you need to configure the bleeds and you need the right main boost pump for that start. So it will configure the bleed airs for the start and it turns on that main boost pump. Then I'm gonna to reach to the overhead panel where here I'm gonna hit the start switch. When I do that, it initiates the start of the airplane and at the same time it turned the beacon light on to let the, everybody know outside that there's going to be a running engine. The FADEC completely manages that start, whether it's a first start of the day or if a rotor bow is required. It does everything for us. Then when the engine comes online, it turns on the alternate boost pump for us. When the alternate uh, boost pump is on and that engine is stable, it's as simple as going to the left engine. I'll select run. The main boost pump is probably already on for the fuel or for the APU. And then at that time, I'll reach up and I'm going to hit the start switch. The left engine is going to come online, at which time the, the alternate boost pump for the left engine will come on. I'm going to do a flight control sweep uh, just to make sure there's no binding in the flight controls. And I'm going to reach over and I'm going to turn on my nose wheel steering. And at this point, I'm ready to taxi. So basically, in that two minutes or so, I told you the entire pre-flight of the airplane uh, from a flight deck perspective and how we manage getting the airplane alive. Uh, the airplane is extremely supportive of what we have to do. We're a big believer that the pilot is the biggest safety thing we have on the flight deck. So we always want the pilot to initiate the task, but the airplane is helping us with all the subtask actions of that as we've just talked about. It's a tremendous airplane and truly makes our job uh, easier so that we can focus on the other higher priority items uh, along the flight. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and subscribe to our channel. Also, visit AINonline.com and check out our e-newsletters for all the latest on the aviation industry.